sesión que estuvo eh, transmitida en vivo y eh, la, 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 la sesión de, de ayer estuvo eh, transmitida en vivo I will, I will give some time in order you could uh, use your devices and Estuvo transmitida en vivo la sesión de ayer y hoy también estará transmitida en vivo la sesión durante toda la, toda la mañana. El día de ayer tuvimos 280 personas que estuvieron siguiendo la sesión en, en inglés y hubo eh, 130 personas que estuvieron siguiendo la sesión en español. ¿no? Entonces, un, un, buen, un buen número. En portugués no me han reportado, Carmiña, pero yo creo que muchos más seguramente. Pero entonces… Eh, eh, durante el día de hoy también va a haber eh, esta transmisión y como les comentaba antes, si después… Es, se está poniendo violento aquí ya el asunto. Como les comentaba antes, eh, si ustedes quieren revisar la, la sesión o si quieren revisar también por otro lado o compartir algunos de los paneles del día de ayer o del día de hoy con sus colegas en casa o en sus oficinas de regreso, va a estar disponible en, la, en el sitio web llamado socialprotection.org. Entonces, ahí va a estar, ustedes ponen semana International Week of Social Protection, ustedes entran ahí, va a estar todo el programa listado y ahí una vez que entran al programa pueden escoger la sesión que les interese, pueden verla, pueden revisarla y por supuesto podrían eh, digamos, sumarse a la conversación que habrá en los distintos foros que hay en el en, en, dicha, eh, en dicha plataforma. ¿no? Entonces, para, para iniciar el día, eh, nosotros eh, en este momento lo que queremos hacer es que ustedes tengan una panorámica de lo que sucedió ayer en cada uno de los grupos. Es decir, ustedes saben que hubo cuatro grupos, hubo un grupo que estuvo trabajando el tema de protección social y atención a grupos, digamos, de ancianos, eh, y particularmente discapacitados y jóvenes. Hubo otro grupo que estuvo trabajando el tema de protección social e infancia, Hubo otro grupo que estuvo trabajando el tema de protección social y desastres naturales y otro, hubo otro grupo más que estuvo trabajando el tema de protección social y creación de empleo. Entonces, nuestros moderadores, perdón, nuestros relatores nos van a compartir un poco, un pequeño resumen de lo que pasó en cada uno de esos, de esos grupos para que ustedes tengan una panorámica. Posteriormente, ustedes van a tener también el documento por escrito para que ustedes puedan revisarlo y compartirlo, ¿no? porque algunos pues, no pudieron estar en todos los, todos los grupos, entonces eh, para de esa manera puedan conocer un poquito más. Entonces, quisiera pedirle al, a, digamos, a nuestro relator del Grupo A, que trabajó el tema de protección social para ancianos, eh, discapacidad… Ah, Juan José, por favor, si nos ayudas, gracias. Muchas gracias, muy buenos días tengan todos, todas. Para quien no me eh, ubica, yo estoy encargado por parte de CEDESOL del programa de comedores comunitarios. Hay quienes eh, tuve el honor y la suerte de, de haber podido acompañarlos en uno de los comedores y pues eh, eh, otro, otros grupos, otros dos grupos estuvieron con mis compañeros. Pues eh, en relación a, a lo que se platicó ayer en la mesa, que es protección social para adultos mayores personas con discapacidad y jóvenes, pues se eh, estuvo presente eh, eh, por parte eh, de la, direct la directora general de la Junta de Coordinación de Políticas Públicas eh, del Consejo Nacional para el Desarrollo e Inclusión de las Personas con Discapacidad, Alicia Loza García. También estuvo por parte de la Dirección General del Instituto Nacional de las Personas de Adultos Mayores, Tania Lisbeth Torres. Estuvo el director de investigación en estudios sobre juventud, eh, nuestro amigo Rodrigo Medinilla, y estuvo el subsecretario. Something about what was uh, discussed about the two questions and the and the concerns that came up within the, in our meeting uh, on the part of Conadis, that is Alicia Loza. 
emphasis was on the fact that uh, physically handicapped people are the ones that have the fewest uh, opportunities for development and less capacity to be uh, included in the labor force. Uh, that's why uh, we had to say that it's very important that, first of all, uh, they, sh they should have uh, that there should be accessibility for them uh, from uh, physically and uh, labor, you know, employment wise and such, and an education. Because many, in, many, in many instances, these are people that, due to their uh, condition, they are put aside. They're not part of the mainstream culture. So uh, this should be universal for all, for all people uh, experiencing going through this kind of situations. And uh, emphasis was made about why people became aware or how they became integrated, people suffering from a physical, physical handicap or disability, and all the rights of the people with disabilities and uh, the, the community sharing of rights. Uh, there's a campaign. This is, this is kind of done, done orally, you know. This is, is how they spread the news so that people may be, be told about their rights and the possibilities they have to, to, uh, to solve certain kinds of problems. Now, one of the practices that was uh, mentioned, one of the good practices mentioned that uh, Alicia Losa told us about was that uh, the, uh, dividing the, the breakup into sectors that Conadi said that used to depend uh, uh, they used to depend on another agency and uh, paradigm, b being able to write the medical para and existentialist uh, kind of paradigm. That is ex that only for uh, physically handicapped or maybe a, a person having health problems, but now instead of all, the person uh, that needs a certain uh, type of social development so that they may be exercise their rights, they may, so that they may practice their rights, the rights they're entitled to. Now, regarding some of the comments and observations uh, uh, stated uh, from INAPAM, which is the National Institute uh, for the Protection of Elder Citizens, uh, there were certain points which were relevant. It was mentioned that elder citizens uh, tend to live longer, surely um, in all parts of the world, but here in Mexico, this uh, situation is uh, coming about in which uh, well, the uh, well people tend to live longer uh, and, uh, and so uh, there uh, we are, have an increasing number of elder adults and that re that situation represents an important area of opportunity regarding social development because since they live longer now they need more attention and uh, you know they're rights must be cared for as well. In it, is estimated, it is estimated that in Mexico, this longevity will, uh, you know, uh, there will come a time when, uh, since every time the elder adult, uh, well, you know, their uh, lifespan uh, tends to be longer in 40 years, which is not that long really, uh, we have to get ready for that situation, which represents a challenge, because <laughs> well, there will be quite a few more elder citizens in 40 years, and of course, we uh, will have to need uh, to know the rights that we're entitled to. Now, something very important in, in APAM uh, grants its beneficiaries a card, a card that more than anything and they have uh, become aware that it, it provides them with an uh, identity. They, it makes them feel included and with a, an acknowledgement within society. I must say personally that my father has one of these uh, INAPAM cards, and it provides them with numerous benefits. They are uh, given discounts in transportation, discounts in public services, and this makes them feel that, that they, uh, they are acknowledged as elder adults that have already developed their lives in, and or lived their lives in the previous uh, years, you know. And this gives them access to culture as well. And of course, within this culture, well, 
uh, the intent is is that uh, there there is a, a a culture of aging people because it was combined and I'm going to get ahead of myself a bit. I had my my friend from Injube, the Mexican Institute for Youth, uh, for uh, youth. Uh, well, there, there was a, a virtual circle there that uh, was set up there because he said that young people, well, uh, a project is being prepared in order to make the, the young people aware that the rights of elder uh, citizens are just as important as uh, rights for youth. So uh, that way we can uh, generate an awareness, and this will become a culture, a, a culture of protection towards both vulnerable groups, both uh, you know, both the young and the elder. Within the practices mentioned, our uh, friend from Inapam, they have a, a comprehensive integration center attention for or care care for elder adults. There's daycare for them. Uh, and she was telling us that these were like almost like a, you know uh, like kindergarten for children, but that the elder adult should not be treated like a child. What they do is that what happens to them is that they need a space where they can feel that they have company that and that it can be uh, du duly cared for in these uh, places. M uh, Mr. Benita Medinilla from from Injube, he talked about this. Uh, cross-cutting aspects. For example, uh, yeah, the yeah, young people are strategic uh, stakeholders. Uh, they're strategic actors. What they want, we want to formulate public policies for second opportunities. M young people, f he mentioned cases, for example. For example, let's say a young girl became pregnant. Well, she needed to have an, uh, an opportunity of, of being reintegrated again into the labor force can continue working and not just be excluded or maybe a young man because of certain circumstances if he goes and studies at, at some place and he comes back he may be included once again and Pablo Charelli from management and information analysis what he emphasized there was a use the statistical use of the data they have in Argentina in order to identify, they have the idea of the gentleman we have here in the CC of identifying statistically where the uh, sector of the population uh, that is needy, what needs they have, and uh, what kind of public resources they require. Uh, this is what I can tell you that we had in our uh, table. There was a very good participation, so I want to thank you for the time you have given me. Thanks very much. Well, thanks very much, Juan Jose. And now I would like to ask, uh, I believe, Luis, Luis, who was in uh, social protection uh, and natural disasters. Could you please tell us what you would, uh, talked about? I'd like to tell you that on the first table, this one about uh, uh, social protection and elder citizens, uh, people who are, are uh, f uh, physically handicapped. There were 23 people in this one. Luis is going to tell you about there were 15. We had 15 participants. Okay, good morning. Well, we were uh, in, the, uh, in the table uh, uh, considering uh, social protection systems and natural disasters, and there were representatives uh, from uh, National Foundation for Civil Protection, the Interior Ministry, from we from CISOL, and uh, representatives from governments of Indonesia, Philippines, and Malawi as well, and uh, on our side, Ticonsa. Basically, uh, the discussion uh, concerned how social protection systems may uh, contribute to the prevention and the management of natural disasters. Uh, we understand that natural disaster is a combination of a purely uh, natural phenomenon that may be meteorological and a socioeconomic or a human phenomenon. That is a combination, the combination and the result. Of, of, of an earthquake, a tsunami, uh, uh, or such thing with combinations of vulnerability or socioeconomic poverty. That combination is what uh, really we understand as a natural disaster. And in this regard, 
uh, impoverished population, vulnerable population, is disproportionately Im impacted by uh, these events but for reasons uh, which are quite clear. You know, vulnerable population has fewer mechanisms uh, in, in order to uh, resist uh, this uh, natural event. Therefore, it's more difficult for them to recover their property, their sources of income, and whatever capabilities or capacities may have been impacted uh, due to this external shock or the natural disaster. In this regard, uh, it's relevant uh, to design uh, social protection systems which can be adapted, which can be tailored to these uh, impacts and that may have a flexible sort of re a flexible and timely response when uh, natural disasters occur and that uh, and for there to be a a, a kind a, a resilience uh, that may become resilient it's important to undertake measures to prevent natural disasters or mitigate the risks occurring in natural disasters in as much as is possible. And of course, uh, take measures once, once the shock, the external shock happens and the uh, protocols of attention in that regard uh, well, must be uh, put into practice. Now, some of the main elements that uh, were mentioned uh, as essential in order to have uh, social protection systems uh, uh, which are uh, adapt, uh, uh, adaptational, uh, which are tailored, which are tailored, such as reserve funds, contingency credits, or, or catastrophic uh, uh, bonds. Emer emergency, let's say emergency funds. They have said in, in Indonesia, they have reserve funds that they, uh, that, that they put out once a natural disaster occurs. Uh, in Mexico, for example, Santa Perez, which is the National uh, Council for uh, and Disaster Prevention, we have these uh, catastrophic or catastrophe emergency uh, funds. Once we have these uh, natural uh, uh, catastrophes occur, then we have information systems that make it possible to have early warnings. You know that will make it possible to evaluate the risk. Uh, for communities that can be impacted by natural disasters. In the case of Mexico, uh, the, the Atlas, uh, uh, the National uh, Atlas for Risks, uh, published by Senapret, uh, that monitors all hydrometeorological phenomena that may be that may become natural disasters. Then on the so part of so we have the prevent platform as part of the social integral social information system, which identifies the risks, vulnerabilities, and threats uh, uh, for different populations at the state and municipal level, taking a preventive approach. Uh, besides the uh, uh, information systems, well, what is now more developed what is now more present are the attention protocols. That is, once a natural disaster occurs, uh, 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 declarations of emergency, logistics networks for the supply uh, of, of, of food, uh, well, for the, uh, the uh, measures post shock, reconstruction plans, and, and uh, uh, basic social restructuring, and other measures, and other measures, other recovery measures. And in this regard, for example, the work of the CONSA in the case of Mexico is essential given the fact that it's a log logistic distribution network for foodstuffs and, and that has national covery, uh, coverage uh, close to uh, well, the 30 stores that may be used uh, exactly to, to cope with, with those who have experienced damages or harm uh, caused by natural disasters. An important point that was mentioned is the coordination both uh, among institutions or uh, in the, the, between the various levels, government levels, and then between the public and private sectors, the NGOs, international organizations. And that's where we identified the greater, the more areas of opportunity. In Mexico, for example, uh, and also in other countries, mm, it's, a, it's a, a, a rather complex subject, how to coordinate all the, do the donations 
uh, uh, after the come aftershock uh, me mechanisms for accountability and uh, and uh, channeling the, and uh, for channeling these resources together with the government actions as far as uh, the attention that is and uh, care in the case of disasters. I think those are the highlights of what we discussed yesterday. How to think. Uh, uh, how to think about a, a tailor-made uh, social practice. And uh, at the end of the day is how to design mechanisms for gathering information after the shocks. And that's one of the, that's one of the main inputs. So the social uh, uh, policy and information systems um, uh, to become really adapted. To, uh, we really have to take a, an instant uh, post-shock snapshot so as to come to uh, better informed decisions, uh, well, inf uh, more thoroughly informed decisions. That's a change that uh, where there is still a lot of room, a lot of space for growth, and we're developing methodologies uh, by means of, uh, uh, of this uh, 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 lab data, lab gathering data, uh, or um, data gathering lab, excuse me, rather. And we have to need information that that sh should uh, give us information uh, regard uh, after the shock, after it occurs. And this is something that we discussed toward the end uh, of the session. That would be what I have brought for you. Well, thanks very much, Luis. Now I'd like to ask Edgar Ramirez, the General Director of Analysis uh, 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 Prospects, uh, tell us what to happen in this group of social protection and employment or job creation. Good morning, everyone. Well, my my table on social protection and job protection tried to establish this link th between both types of policies. And in some way, uh, we, we had some um, interesting ideas in this regard you know, about how to build a protection system uh, emphasizing the uh, relevance of the coordination between these uh, ki these uh, s types of policies and uh, uh, how to make them uh, comprehensive within what happened, what was stated by our moderator. We had to look at issues such as sustainability, uh, financial sustainability of a, uh, of a, of a protection system. Uh, throughout the panel, uh, we had the cases of Mexico, South Africa, and India, in which the three countries showed us their experiences and, uh, and trying to generate uh, productive inclusion policies, especially uh, considering the most vulnerable groups. All this practice was enriched with their participation from the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, and the, and the, the FEI, a Food Agricultural Organization, uh, concerning situations occurring in the job markets and also uh, several challenges and limitations in scope of productive inclusion were discussed in the first presentation. In the Mexican case, the Assistant Minister Fernando Maldonado from the Labor Ministry pointed out the positive results uh, that, that achieved during this administration in terms of job generation, talking about a, a, a record of more than 3.7 million uh, jobs created during this, uh, this presidential term and compared that with uh, other administrations, it's the highest figure that has uh, been that uh, we have achieved considering job creation. Job creation led uh, to an increase in formal that kind of uh, employment, and uh, the figures of the official statistics, show official, official statistics, that's what they show, and and this was accompanied by increases in jobs uh, and in the buying power of workers, and in workers' buying power. Thus, we try to establish a link between, for example, the, re the positive results uh, accomplished in job generation, and, and this would uh, impact also uh, in the creation of formal jobs and access uh, to, so, uh, to uh, a certain rights by the workers that were, bene that were benefited from these new uh, jobs created. Now, uh, which had established a link between these results and what the, the uh, policies for uh, uh, labor inclusion have been and, uh, and that uh, occurred recently. And the link is established basically because in a macroeconomic context where uh, 
uh, the growth rates don't seem to change too much uh, considering what was observed during the, the previous uh, presidential administration. Well, the job generation was significantly greater. And this is the assistant minister attributes this to uh, uh, all, all the uh, employment, uh, other job creation policies uh, that were put in place. Also, the program uh, for uh, uh, online training and also uh, tra specific training with based on the competency standards, uh, that link up between schools and uh, uh, job markets, as well as legal actions uh, regarding manpower formation, the multiplying agents in the national e employment system. Finally, he said that the new technologies are changing labor dynamics uh, and uh, social uh, protection in Mexico uh, should be aimed at uh, following these trends. He also emphasized within the challenges, uh, well, the need to better integrate uh, the, uh, our labor system uh, and our uh, the needs uh, emphasized to uh, link up the efforts uh, made by industries and uh, by various uh, businesses and the issue of training, job training, or the educational aspect, you know, training for uh, productive jobs. Now, in the case of India, the uh, explanation concentrated on the generation of jobs uh, in the rural uh, environment were basically results of the program no, no material resource management uh, were presented, uh, implemented under four categories, which is the uh, supply of uh, public work, individual g goods, and uh, uh, rural infrastructure aimed at rural development uh, since uh, um, in the rural environment, we have opportunities for people who are more vulnerable, and uh, in accordance to the um, well, to the in that kind of uh, uh, in, uh, place where they live, that's where they can have, uh, work. Our policy to provide a minimum standard of social uh, protection for the most vulnerable population. He said that for the achievements. Uh, uh, a very important effort in planning has been required, as well as the participation of multidisciplinary groups in order to try to generate a comprehensive policy in order to cover the needs of this population. In the case of South Africa, uh, uh, in some way, the uh, ans answers provided by the government in critical uh, job situations in the last few years for example, there have been significant there have been significantly high rates of unemployment, uh, where today more than 6.7 million people are uh, being affected by this phenomenon. And uh, he also pointed out the existence of a uh, important gap in the social security system and the, uh, the great uh, uh, pressures regarding uh, salaries that, that occur in the country. The public employment programs, for example, link the public and private sector in order to provide uh, uh, job opportunities and income opportunities for the, the poor and um, unemployed uh, population. And regarding public goods and services, and, and there were intensive programs in order to contribute uh, to development. The com uh, program is supported with their training and has contributed to the development of communities. Finally, you mentioned the points of generating policies against the poverty uh, and, um, and, and, and social structures that be linked up uh, with uh, uh, the social needs and, of course, labor needs from these uh, sectors. And other the positions of the international agencies were presented through by Margaret Loss, who is here with us and who, that represents the World Bank. And it was pointed out that um, that the organization policies must be based on the elimination of biases which affect or distort uh, job markets, and that these policies uh, should be aimed at reducing inequalities and, uh, and that uh, uh, also the need to reach a, a balance between labor regulation for various uh, groups within the population and improve and imp uh, in order to improve the results we must consider financial crisis uh, structural unemployment and progress that must be made in occupational transition and the displacements in the job market that occurred due to new technologies a new phenomenon that is occurring globally and that may have any and a significant impact and now Margaret mentioned uh, uh, some of the uh, need, part of the need 
uh, to have uh, comprehensive policies whereby each one of the components uh, is present uh, so that they may so that uh, positive results may, of these policies can be guaranteed and david kaplan a specialist uh, from the labor market from the Central American Development Bank said that there is a trend towards the reduction of uh, incomes and this may be due to the among other things to certain factors such as technological change and that decrease in productivity and that not necessarily unions will represent effectively the workers within this context they're pointing out the importance of uh, the inefficiencies and it's also to rethink the relationship between product, social protection and the labor market. And so as we make progress, we can see the guarantee and they will be mediated by the active participation of the labor market. And finally, we had the representative of FAO, Crispin Moreira, who highlighted the achievements of certain programs for uh, employment creation in the rural area. 40% of the agricultural production was made by these medium, small producers that they live uh, in very poor conditions. In this scenario, we require a more um, focused approach and then to incorporate a social component that could promote the human development and could be thought in a regional and territorial approach. And the experience of that speaker, some of the programs have been successful because they combined monetary transfer with these uh, production uh, features such as training and many others. And they are trying to improve uh, the household's conditions to diversify the income and to fight back poverty to empower economic and socially women and also to go back to the resilient households. In conclusion, and from all the ideas that are being taken from this dialogue, is that in all these in productive inclusion programs, we can see a political possibility with a potential to face poverty in a sustainable way. Nonetheless, we have these complex mechanisms where results can be seen in the short, medium, or even in the long term. And they, it, it is also important that they are uh, accompanied by other policies that will guarantee the rights of the population. And we should establish this binding uh, feature or this linkage of social protections and labor markets. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Edgar. So I would like to ask Oliver Arroyo, the Director General for Evaluation and Monitoring of Social Programs. Good morning, everybody. We were the rapporteurs of Social Protection and Childhood. Four countries participated in this table. Uh, we have Mexico, Peru, Brazil, and South Africa. And we have three experts from Mexico. One, for the system of integral uh, protection of uh, uh, for teenagers and uh, children. Sabina, for the vulnerable groups, and the director general for the, the CEDESOL daycare centers. The moderator was Ines Tristado from the Inter-American Bank of Development. and. Or IDB, and she shares a diagnosis of why it was important to talk about social protection and childhood. The first diagnostic is that if we saw the indicators for social protection and childhood in the four or five decades, we can see that there is a decrease in the children mortality, an increase in weight and height, and greater levels for um, education for minors. As you can see, these variables in a microeconomic level, you can see that everything is moving uh, okay, and we can have uh, everything good in the first cycle of life, which is the most important one for children. But when you try to zoom it in, and then you can see so, the shortages or the certain specific indicators, even from from the pregnancy, you can find that according to the different gaps that are in the income of the mother and in the family, those gaps are getting stronger and stronger in certain indicators. What are those indicators that we're discussing? Well, we're talking about cognitive development, 
lang language matrix and affectional developments. And then we started to discuss what are the different challenges. So these gaps uh, cannot be started from the childhood when they are three months or 36 months or 48 months old. First of all, we had the participation of the representative of Mexico from Mississippina, and he was saying that the challenge for articulating the social policy for the first or the early stage of childhood, it was a lot or a large one, because there are some programs and interventions that seem to be unarticulated. On one side, we have the social development, and on the other hand, we have the human development. He used clear examples, for instance, Prospera, where we have educational components and food components, as well as we health components, while they improve the conditions of those children, they are not enough or not importantly or robust enough to tackle the family context. So what do we mean with a family context? What the f in these early stages, on the early eight years, were all these uh, uh, shortages, inequalities, the lack of affection, and they would not have the same cognitive developments. And with this, the, this uh, it have a lot of evidence, and then it, this is also a very good predictor on how the children will do in the future. In order to tackle that context, and the biggest challenge that we found for articulating these uh, policies is how to articulate the human development and social development in public policies. It was also mentioned that on, on behalf of Peru, the biggest challenge is to take all the different programs that they already have for the early stages or the early years. They were telling us about a program that is called Gundamas, where they are not only providing assistance and of monitoring to all these families and stakeholders, but also they are looking for the uh, early stimulation of uh, these children they are attending, or this is addressed to 0 to 36 months, and there is another program from 7 to 17 years old. Five, so there is a way that it is not being uh, walked like from 3 to 6 years old, and uh, so the public policy should be articulated to close this gap. They were also telling us that the expansion of this program is one of the main priorities for the social development ministry in Peru, as well as implementation of the local governments is essential. Going hand in hand with the different skills that the family should develop, the mother or even the child, when is moving from one cycle, that is preschool, to the school, is uh, are essential for the cognitive development. The, in Peru, they also have the challenge of uh, reducing anemia because it's already at 43% right now. And for that purpose, they not only need to train the families and mothers, but also to incorporate and articulate these public policies, such as these uh, food uh, supplements, the breastfeed to promote breastfeeding and to know exactly what are the faces that these uh, each of the uh, children are located so they not feel unprotected we also had the participation of brazil talking about these public policy challenges where they not only mentioned this um, effective uh, emotional bond that should be from uh, the beginning so we have also find that the poverty can create a very robust and rigid uh, area that would not allow the psycho-emotional development of the babies. At the end of the day, it could be translated in a lower level of development or, or a lower uh, rate of affectional bonds. So by strengthening this from home uh, uh, along with the public policies. When we talk about social cohesion, and also was discussed by Brazil, we need to have all type of education, not only basic education, but the, from the maternal and core area. This will allow to make the government closer to these localities and to those social promotions so we can follow them. Brazil was also mentioning how they we're trying to strengthen these uh, affectional bonds in order to promote empathy and to create these greater relationship bonds. 
and social bonds. So we're looking that the, the contact from the government is the one creating all these bonds and creating these social cohesion as understood that are more empathic. The representative of DIF uh, was uh, saying that this is uh, norms in legal aspects in terms of the initial education in, in our country. And there are different programs to support the community. They have some of these uh, breakfast schools, also the attention with the vulnerable groups. But among the challenges that, that the representative of DIF was uh, saying was the continuity of the project. Sometimes all these projects depend on the good willingness or of the different uh, municipal presidents, which is at the lowest level of the government or the, in the states. And that is strategy. A public policy cannot continue effectively in the medium and long term if they always, de if a, they always depends, depend on the policies. For DIF, linking these uh, children development centers in the country along with the norms or standards, how integrate that is essential. He, she mentioned also the visits at households from the discussion of Brazil and Peru. This uh, household's visit has a very strong budget. However, it could be one of the catalyzers to create a greater funds. Finally, she mentioned that the articulated work from the municipalities allow us to address uh, all these uh, to the children population. And at the end, we have the director of uh, the daycare centers from Ceresol, and they are working in social development in terms of the budget. However, they have a lot of a companion or they are in, in addition uh, jointly efforts with the DIF. So they have this collaborative work. And this is a clear example of how public policies could be articulated for that purpose. Also, she ma he mentioned a lot of uh, round numbers, around 300,000 of centers for daycares, and many of them are below those uh, lines of well-being, so they are vulnerable. And we need as the main challenge to strengthen the system, not only in terms of visits and uh, directions or follow-ups, but also in the assessment of these daycare centers and the early development of children. At the end of the session, Ines Tistao created a series of conclusions as a wrap-up because we were we were talking about different topics, but the time was running out. We consider this is an essential topic topic because all the different investment that could be done in the earliest years of the children. But in conclusion, she mentioned that the challenges are multidimensional, thinking in all these indicators that we were discussing at the beginning of the session and multisectorial due to all the different problems and the experiences of the countries to articulate the policies for the subject we recognize at the end of the session, and it was quite surprising to uh, oh, make that the children are vulnerable to this context. And, and it is uh, if we can take all and gather all the evidence for this. Uh, early years of development, we can notice that the context is quite an, an essential point. So this uh, social co cohesion and the effective uh, bonds sh should be taken into account. It is also important to find some instruments and to articulate administrative tools for attention to children that would allow to have this territory focalization to the families and also to use this uh, programmatic dispersion as a tool to use efficiently the technology that is uh, used in the different government because this is a multi-sectorial and multi-dimensional problem. Without any further ado, uh, we finish the meeting and we can have uh, this uh, agreement for this global alliance to, uh, to do something for this uh, more comprehensive development in children. Thank you very much. Thank you, Oliver. So I don't know if any of you have anything to share, or I think our colleagues made a quite an exhaustive and a quite and complete work, something that was surprising to you, something that you didn't expect to hear. Anything?
Okay. If there is anything else, one of the principles that we mentioned at the beginning of this week, or you agreed on, was generosity. Generosity to share. So don't forget that. So we need to share. So we are going to share in the sense of no, in for the detail, the work of social protection to keep the uh, achievements of uh, social protection and poverty. For that panel, we would have uh, Simon Sekini. He is uh, one of the general representatives of the Commission for the Caribbean and Latin America. We will have Ensign Iñaki and Rebo Encinas, the Director General of Statistics and, and Beneficiaries Register. We will also have Ana Paola de la O Campos. She works in strategic programs for reducing rural poverty in the in FAO. And also would like to ask Mary Ann Dara why she's a director of social development of of the social development, economic development in the Philippines. So Mary, please. And Carlos Vidal, Vice Minister of the Social Development in Guatemala. Good morning to all of you. I hope you are enjoying the day. We have one hour for this panel. And as Francisco was saying, it's, this is about social protection and how to keep the achievements that we've made. Uh, and maybe just to have these, uh, how to keep these achievements could have a macro perspective, especially in Latin America, where we have some between two, 12, 2012 and 2014. We have achieved a lot in reducing poverty. The in 2002 was 45.9 and in 2014 it was 28.5% inequalities and uh, at the beginning of the 2000 or the millennium was over 0.5 in 2016 it was reduced 0.476 so we've gotten some achievements however the poverty levels in our region and inequality levels are unacceptable However, there's also a micro perspective because while we have achieved that some families are getting out of poverty, there is still some uh, vulnerabilities in poverty and uh, there are also medium layers that are quite vulnerable in our countries for losing a job or natural disasters, for disease, for, and they need this protection. From there, that is why we have this importance of of what we have uh, discussed all these days for the universal social protection, as well as taking and having these unique or coordinated registers and all this uh, information that will constitute or will comprise the, the main core, the main axis for social protection. And they should be quite broadened and updated frequently. So in this panel, we have three countries. We have Mexico, Guatemala, Philippines, and also we have our colleague from the International Organization, FAO, and we are going to address all these topics. So I'm going to ask to each of the panel members to talk for five minutes tops be for each of the answers. And so let's start with the, the, the hosts. Let's start with Luis Iñaki. We are going to ask him about the information system for the social the social inf uh, integration system that is called SISI in Spanish. So if you can freshen up uh, the idea, what is this about? And especially the question, what is the function of this social information of integration system for the eradication of poverty and re reducing in inequalities? I think this works better. Good morning. This uh, 
comprehensive social information system will include different databases. There is going to process them to create strategic information for um, the decision-making process in social development uh, areas. The different uh, databases that we are taking into account are from different uh, natures, it's particularly on one side we have the information that is socioeconomic, that is being self-reported by the different households that are, could be receptible to receive these social programs. This information could be focused or could be centered in one of the centers of the CC, that is uh, the CIFODE in Spanish, of uh, development uh, center of, of the system. And the function of this part of the system is precisely to characterize the possible beneficiaries for these social development programs and according to the criteria of each of the programs is are stating or defining. So we can obtain a, a universe of uh, potential beneficiaries. We have identified 40 million people in Mexico that represent two out of three people that are in poverty. On the other hand, we are going to integrate these administrative registers of those who have already received or are receiving that benefit. And it's been understood as a register in, in other places. And they are going to consolidate the different registers or lists of those who have already received our support. And they are produced by the same programs and by the same authorities. Then we have identified 80 million of unique beneficiaries through 270 registers at the state and federal level and some at the municipal level. On the other side, or another important uh, component of CC is to have this uh, space uh, data and would set the a geographical area, that means where all these uh, be potential beneficiaries live based on the basic infrastructure, road w roads, schools, clinics, uh, or even these uh, soup kitchens, the Licons stores, and some others. So this is the geospatial information, and this is georeference, and also included w with the CIFODE information and the EPU information. And lastly, another important component of the SISA is the preventive platform. And this is an effort to use these uh, data science techniques on this information and other resources to migrate to a correct, the, the, that migrating from a corrective uh, prevent uh, social e rules to uh, preventing social rules. One of the f important features of this system is that it is going to be constituted as a unique repository and at the same time a shared one. It is equally important to have a unique feature that means this decentralized where all the different uh, data sources can come flow, but it also should be shared and distributed to the different actors. In that sense, we've made a very important effort to find different alliances, partnerships, and c different agreements for sharing and exchanging information with the different uh, orders of the government. Now we have 26 states of the country out of the 32 that have this ex uh, information exchange agreement, which is also very important due to the nature of the personal data that this information has. It's important to formalize this uh, exchange of information and to clarify what type of data have been exchanged and how they should be used. Uh, to conclude, the uh, CC is a technical tool that will help you to resolve a technical problem. However, it is also important to th bear in mind the institutional design that can provide the support to the system. And there is still more uh, things to do to make a progress. We need to reform the legal framework in terms of social aspects to introduce this system as an important component in the national policies for social protection. And also to have this institutional support beyond the governments that are in place at that moment.
basically that is it and I think I use my five minutes thank you very much Luis Iñaki I think we always need to point out that these information systems are one of the biggest achievements. It's almost like a revolution in the social policies. Mexico has been a pioneer in this sense, but many other countries in Latin America has gotten a, a lot of progress too. And it had made, it, it is even more transparent and more efficient. And also allow us to coordinate among different sectors uh, where because there are different sectors fighting poverty is not only in one ministry. And in order to do that, we need to find out this uh, system. Now, let's go uh, past the floor to the Vice Minister of Guatemala, Carlos Vidal, and we are going to make the, say the following question. We know that Poli uh, public resources are limited, especially for the countries that are even more poor. And how to take the decisions, what is the impact and the impact of changing from universalized and to focalize those efforts for eradicating poverty? Well, good morning is quite a privilege and an honor being here. I'm very thankful for your hospitality and also to thank Sede Sol Prospera because the learning curve in our case has been improved, derived from the different exercises and all the work that we're doing jointly with all our brothers. And the question is exactly that the resources is ex is are limited. The problem is that there is no, or up to today, a social or political commitment of increasing those resources. Our country has the 49% of poverty, 26% of extreme poverty, and above 46% of uh, chronic malnutrition in children. Our poverty is quite intense, quite deep, and when we start analyzing the different factors at the core family level, we can notice that the families are growing without any floor, with any roof, with just uh, something that is just trying to cover with the access to health, with access to running water, that they need to walk three or four hours to attend school or to a uh, health center. So then we notice uh, what we have is a lack of planning and a lack of social policies. And this is part of uh, what our brothers from Mexico have done, this uh, social pact, this fiscal pact, which are very important. We started in our administration with the President Jimmy Morales to start creating a focalization strategy. Uh, I really call my attention what you were saying yesterday. If we are going to have a policy with a greater coverage and that uh, we are going to be more intense, this is an intensity uh, or intensive policies. So we have focalized the different departments and sectors where the areas of poverty are the highest or the malnutrition are also the highest. But we also we were talking about the substitution. This is something that really called my attention yesterday. Uh, the, some of the panel members were saying they were also trying to to hide the sun with just one finger. We cannot have this conference, and I hope this is, there are some families that will not have running water, so basic services, and that family w could not get out of poverty. That would be impossible. It's impossible to have all the resources overnight and to provide the services to more than three million families in Guatemala. So now we have all these political decisions that have a political price at the short run, and also in the long run, what the real policy is, what the country should be focused, and that is sustainability, and that is also development, not only in the economic terms, but also the human and the more comprehensive one in terms of the family. As a consequence of all these multidimensional factors for poverty, we also have different multiple consequences or results. We have migration, we have uh, children molestation, we have children taking care of, ne of children in our country. And this is a, a crisis factor in my country. We also have a demographic growth that is quite dangerous because even if we increase social investment, the demographic growth can set that a risk and a huge challenge. 
so undoubtedly the decision must be to uh, focus and to integrate uh, different communities and empower them because we can't think that the state is going to ha have all the answers to and all the, res all the resources in the field to reach everyone and then that's where we have the social fabric that's so important. In Guatemala we have multiple thousands of communities uh, that we're empowering in issues of education and this leads me to the uh, same because uh, we could uh, talk all day long about this but uh, here education and I'm not just talking about academic education, uh, education as far as habits, education uh, uh, regarding how to get along uh, with uh, others in your community, uh, food, nutrition, uh, learning how, how to feed oneself and, and um, uh, be uh, nourished in order for communities to be participants and protagonists of their own development. We have to take education to them at all costs and, and, and from any angle, from all angles. That's why we have we need technology and social innovation. We consider that education is the pillar and the source for all of the resources invested by the state to be well executed and well used by communities in order to achieve better results. Thanks very much. Thanks, Carlos. Uh, for uh, pointing out the emerging uh, challenges. Uh, you know what you mentioned about immigration and children caring for children. We from CEPAL in this eternal debate, uh, focalization against the you know, coming concentration against the uh, universalization. We want to look around, uh, uh, you know, with uh, we want to look at concentration as a result and making something universal as an end in itself and also the uh, focus or the approach on the right because this must be progressive even though uh, the, the focus on the right says that we should have uh, universal p uh, policies we know that the resources are limited but we have to make a, a progress uh, eventually uh, in order for all these rights to be something universal now we'll go to Ana Paolo, our friend from the FAO. Uh, and the question for you is as follows, uh, and uh, a bit in the future. Where do you think is public po policies and social, in social development aimed at? Uh, and how do uh, the new technologies uh, influence uh, uh, the social fabric? Because uh, it was said that uh, poverty had gone down in 2014, but in a more complex economic context, we have noticed an increase of uh, increase. We have noticed an increase in the growth of uh, the impoverished sectors. Can I be heard? Well, first of all, I want to thank truly. It's a privilege to be here, thanks to Sol and to JSA for having invited the FAO to participate as Food and Agricultural Organization. And personally, as a Mexican, because I, uh, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not in uh, Fao in Roma, but I, I, I have come to Mexico uh, for work reasons for me. Uh, uh, personally, it's, uh, it's, it's a great pleasure coming to my country to answer Simon's question, I think that this is, we should start from where we are, what we have learned. And Simon already mentioned, during the last 20 to 30 years, we have reduced poverty, including rural p poverty, in a sustained manner. So we have to, uh, have to acknowledge that progress has been made in this regard. We have learned a lot in the process. And I think that uh, the learning that we have leads us uh, to think about the elements uh, that our strategy to reduce poverty should cover, especially extreme poverty. We know that, in particular, uh, the growth of uh, employment and income, and the growth of income, of course, is the uh, is the most important uh, factor uh, in order to reduce and finally re remove poverty, eliminate poverty. And also, we have learned uh, that there are essential investments that must be made, especially in health and education, which have played a key role in uh, sustaining this growth, especially on a long-term basis. We shouldn't look side of the of the role played by the economy in um, for growth, and, and especially the the growth of employment and income and the increase of income. And uh, we have learned a lot from the uh, social protection programs. We have generated numerous 
uh, social protection programs, including those for transfers, whether they're conditioned or non or unconditioned according to objectives pursued. And uh, we have learned uh, also a lot regarding uh, impact evaluations which accompany these uh, programs. I think that with these elements, we have a lot to, to say about uh, how uh, poverty is reduced in uh, the various countries. And we continue to have a very important uh, challenge ahead of us, like Simone said, and right now in a, a context of low economic growth, growth rate and growing conflicts, which also uh, prevents us from making progress in, in, in reducing poverty, especially extreme poverty. And, uh, well, of course, in this new uh, scenario of climate change. Well, uh, from th that's where I, I, I'm starting to answer your question, Simon. And since I come from FAO, from FAO, I'll focus on rural po poverty because uh, globally, 80% of extreme poverty uh, is located in uh, rural areas. And especially if we look at it, uh, uh, in, a, a multi in multiple dimensions, that's how we see it. And uh, we have to remember that when we talk about rural poverty, we're not talking about a, a certain poverty, but many kinds of poverty. It's a surprising bit of information, uh, a surprising fact from our last report from the, the FAO, which is the, uh, the uh, report on forests. It is said that 90% of rural poverty in the world is located in forests. So this gives us a very different look, a, a perspective of what it should be. We always think about rural poverty, in agriculture, and the fields. But we're saying, we see that the rural areas have a, a broad biodiversity, uh, very di you know, different contexts that which are closely linked to urban areas, of course, but then the population density, of course, and it's not the same uh, uh, addressing poverty in mountainous area, in mountain areas as in um, marginal farming areas or agricultural areas. So that tells us tells us something about where the public policies should be aimed. But I think that in order to cope with extreme poverty, we have to understand the territories and uh, the specifics of the various ki kinds of poverty that people are living in. I, I don't want to talk you know, in too much detail, I only have five minutes, but I'd like to go back to this issue about how to mobilize investments required you know, to mitigate poverty, because we have this uh, great challenge uh, in the sense that economy has not grown in many parts of the world, not only in Mexico, it's in many other parts of the world. We have to acknowledge the role played by like what our friend from Guatemala said, uh, uh, our Guatemalan friend said, the private sector has a role. I, I, but I'm not saying it just in the sense of, you know, businesses, but also I'm talking about individuals as well, at the individual level. I think that there we have to make more dynamic the, uh, the ability of people to uh, get out of poverty. We shouldn't expect only the state to do it. It's a responsibility for everyone. We, in how we work with China, and what we have learned from them is that besides having a political w willingness to eliminate poverty, and they, they themselves say this, it's also, they, uh, let's say that they incite all sectors of the population to meet a certain quota or to be, to get involved in this strategy of eradication of poverty. So uh, companies must fulfill a quota, public servants, if they want to, um, uh, uh, you know, do, make a career uh, in the public sector, they must uh, live uh, uh, for a certain number of years in remote places in order to better understand. Well, the challenges that 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 in mountainous areas people are going through in China, uh, well, mo most of the Eth uh, most ethnic mi minorities, that's where they live, in, and that's where uh, the, chal the challenge is concentrated in, in China. Well, 
just to bring this to an end from the uh, point of view of uh, the f uh, food agricultural organization considering poverty we believe that there's a great there's great potential in the development of access to preferential markets for example what would be uh, public purchases in the case of family uh, agriculture the development of value chains and also uh, value chains, not only in farming, but also in uh, forestry, and, and also uh, uh, ecosystem services. Food systems may offer um, numerous opportunities, especially in farming areas which are connected, uh, farming or agricultural areas. We have a great field of innovation in this regard, and the good news is that this is already taking place, this innovation, quite apart from the fact that the companies, uh, that the governments are providing support, or that international agencies are providing support. Many uh, markets have become more dynamic regarding food systems. And I think that there we have a, a great opportunity. These are areas which are more connected to, uh, to small cities or towns. We must not forget that most people in the world live precisely in urban areas, but uh, which are really uh, the small townships or cities, and we have to look at these smaller towns or cities as factors in order to make a more dynamic economy. So that's what I would have to say. Thanks very much, Ana Paula. Uh, another m message. Uh, I would emphasize you know, what you have said, that in the future we have to go to, uh, well, let's say classical, traditional services, not to leave anybody behind, not to leave anyone behind. Many times we had to consider sectors of the population, such as rural populations, the people living in forests or mountains, who uh, are difficult to reach. And in our region, much has been said about an active search. Uh, that uh, we cannot think as a public policy that uh, this person necessarily, uh, well, the, 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 there are certain programs and that the state has a, a duty to approach them. And now, let's uh, come out of the region. Uh, 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 let's leave uh, a bit the Latin American and Caribbean region. Let's go to Asia with Marian from the Paraguay from uh, the Philippines. And I believe that it's very important uh, to hold this exchange because I. I know that in, in the Philippines has a condition to transfer programs that did learn something about Latin America, but make Latin America has a, has a lot to learn from country from a, Asian countries which are more egalitarian and that uh, which have a great ability to generate employment. So let's listen uh, to Marianne, and the question would be as follows: What instruments allow the eradication of extreme poverty? from the uh, perspective of the right of rights. Uh, for example, uh, the budget uh, uh, structure, statistics, and uh, that kind of thing. Thanks very much. Muchísimas gracias, Simón. Y buenos días a todos. The Philippines, in order for us to have a collective and a guided and focused uh, agenda and direction for addressing poverty. The Philippines has, for the first time after a long, long time, uh, come up with a long-term vision for the Filipinos. This uh, states that we want, and this was actually asked from every sector and everyone in the Philippines, well, a certain percentage of the populace, now, where they expressed what the kind of life they want up to 2040. And we call it in our own language, ambition natin. Obviously, it is ambition. <laughs> no, it's both a goal and an ambition of the people. So they want a strongly rooted, comfortable, and secure life for all. And with this long-term vision, this is where we anchored the medium term, the first of four medium term development plans for so that with this long-term vision, uh, any new administration will follow on through this vision that uh, we have charted already. And in doing so, we have focused our social protection initiatives in the medium-term development plan for 2017 to 2022. Where, which uh, aims to reduce vulnerability of individuals and families. 
In the plan, we have also specified societal goals, intermediate goals, and sector outcomes, and subsector outcomes. I will not go through all of them, but I want to stress that in this chapter alone, it already talks about universal and transformative social protection for all. In doing so, we address the risks to be able to achieve this uh, in four elements, which is the individual risks, the natural hazards and human in, uh, induced risks, the economic risks, and governance and political risks. The uh, Pantawid program, or the cash transfer, is our main uh, program strategy to achieve the individual uh, to address the, need, the uh, individual risks and to ensure that social protection mechanisms are sustained and further enhanced, the following strategies have been identified and actually followed by the other sectors uh, in the, the other development sectors of the country. These include a convergence approach with uh, uh, will be implemented to ensure that 1.3 million Pantawid household beneficiaries uh, will cross the poverty line and will not fall back into poverty. One way to ensure this is by linking them to social enterprises to capacitate them to engage in livelihood opportunities. Second, the conditional cash transfer will be continued to ensure that the rights of poor children are upheld, and the goal for the covered beneficiaries is 4.4 million in the year 2022. The government will launch new mechanisms to reduce cases of child labor and monitor the government, uh, sorry, and monitor the implementation of relevant policies to ensure that 630,000 decrease in its number by the year 2020. So with the plan actually anchored on the vision, it also um, specifies the targets that we need to meet up uh, in the medium term. And then moving forward, we also intend to expand the coverage of the four Ps. We intend also to formulate a transition policy for graduating four Ps or con uh, cash transfer beneficiaries and then provide livelihood training for surviving spouse from O plan doble or double barrel to prevent children from engaging in hazardous work and refer affected children to the Department of Social Welfare and Development for psychosocial and other support services. To give you just an idea, our focus for addressing the economic risks is uh, are the overseas Filipino workers, the workers in the informal sector, the workers in the formal sector, and specifically the female workers. Uh, some of the programs that will be instituted, instituted and uh, implemented will be the Assist Well or Welfare Employment Legal and Livelihood Program of Dole, uh, of the Department of Labor and Employment con and uh, the 2020 goal for the cum cumulative number of o uh, overseas uh, workers, uh, membership in the office or overseas worker welfare administration of the country. Among the other um, strategies that are going to be uh, implemented will be to strengthen initially or the initiatives on the global compact for safe, orderly, and regular migration to ensure migrants' rights in GCM negotiations and expand bilateral labor agreements aside from increased engagement with OF uh, overseas workers and then uh, to support, to give them support to, form, to formal OF organizations and reinforce Philippine embassies as well. There are other uh, initiatives or rather strategies that are also charted in the development plan. For national hazards, we have included here the, the adoption also of technology where we have identified hazard mapping for effective community-based disaster 
uh, risk migration. This is initiated by the Department of Science and Technology of my country. It aims to address issues in local disaster risk manage management and has three components, which is uh, multi-hazard and risk assessment, community-based disaster risk mit mitigation, as well as uh, the development of community-based early warning systems and conduct of information, education, and communication campaigns, as well as main, uh, mainstreaming disaster risk reduction in local development. The last risk is actually governance and political risks. I think I don't need to expound on this because I, uh, most of us are uh, facing political risks in our respective countries, no? But just the same, what we are saying here is, of course, the institution of uh, uh, relevant legislations or protocols so that uh, everybody will be in sync with the laws of the land. And as we have uh, heard from the presentations yesterday, we have to marry the rights-based uh, um, initiatives with the institutionalization of laws, no? And in summary, as I said, some inst uh, the instruments that will allow the eradication of extreme poverty it, uh, would include legislation for social policies or of social policies. In my country, we have many Magna Cartas for the indigenous peoples, the women, the children, and so on, and even the uh, people with disabilities and and as mentioned by our partner, education is definitely number one in the list of requisite no, for achieving uh, or eradicating uh, extreme poverty and in all forms of education, as mentioned by Sir Carlos, that it is not only education in formal uh, structures, but also in informal structures starting from the families themselves and starting young if possible and where uh, applicable. Then financial reforms in terms of taxation and improved budgeting processes is also a requisite. Aside from technology adoption, to build up the data or information for evidence, uh, uh, be evidence generation. Then the institutionalization of protocols and procedures as well as guidan guidelines and standards. And then the LGU commitments and ownership uh, development. Then national long-term visions and strategic development plans in the short term and medium term are also necessary. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, the concept of private-public partnership is still very effective and very necessary. Aside from also engaging in other innovations as being done already by some of us, and info communication and technologies. There are other uh, instruments that may be adopted, but this, of course, are all dependent on the intricacies of our own respective countries. So I hope uh, you learned some points from my, our own development plan. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias, Marianne. Sí, aprendí, bueno, interesantísimo también, el bueno que la estrategia, el nombre de la estrategia sea ambicioso, ¿verdad? Porque justamente en estos temas estamos política de Estado. Y como tú bien... We cover state policies and these state policies must be uh, guided by legal instruments uh, from uh, for the focus of law. The, uh, the approach of the law, in the law, we, we must include uh, what we have to do, and we must carry out public policies, but we, have to, we need to have a common goal, a common direction, and of course a complete strategy. I think that, as we have seen, we have a, 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 a inclusive uh, production, and we are also covering children, as well as uh, the elders. And coming back, and we'll go back to Licinia, and uh, how has uh, see, see, this system of information, this system of information, how has it uh, uh, contributed in order to set out a state social policy, in order to define it? Well, 
the CC, and that's an, uh, an acronym. Uh, it took us several years to build it, and we have started it. We have a, it came into operation approximately a couple of months ago, but this uh, it, it it contains uh, 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 quite a good uh, a lot of information rather, which has made it possible for us to uh, carry out uh, uh, numerous analysis and share them with uh, uh, social development programs. I think one of the, the most important things and one of the uh, most complex challenges in the case of Mexico, uh, given our current juncture, is uh, identification. Uh, for example, in Mexico, we don't have as yet a national identifier that will be as exhaustive and, uh, and, and unique. We do have an identifier, which is a CURF. RP, not all Mexican men and women have this uh, curb, and those of us who do have this kind of identification is not unique, it may be duplicated. So this is like a, an identification card. And well, several countries have solved this issue, and some haven't as yet, and, and I think it's essential to have it in order to consolidate information and, 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 and be certain about who we're talking about. Okay, so the CC has strongly contributed uh, uh, towards the uh, creation of a inaccurate uh, identification of people. For several years now, we have uh, well the proportion of beneficiaries uh, uh, on on the part of poorly identified programs has dropped, and therefore the proportion of public resources. Uh, um, directed to these people has been reduced, and this uh, uh, pr provides more transparency and clarity regarding whom we are giving uh, resources to in order to fight poverty, of course. Uh, another important point where CC has contributed, and uh, I, I think that we're uh, beginning on that, is the identification and mitigation of uh, inclusion and exclusion errors. Inclusion errors are those people that don't meet eligibility criteria, and yet they're receiving support. And those of exclusion is the opposite. People that do meet requirements, but that for some reason or other, or other they are not yet covered by the program. And in this regard, what uh, well, one of the advantages of the system is precisely that by combining various uh, data sources for coming from different institutions, this gives us, let's say, a photograph that's uh, more uh, certain and more objective regarding what the condition, the socioeconomic condition is regarding a certain uh, person, for example. So what we have done is that we have crossed data from the Social Security Institute, which is the main uh, uh, social security agency that covers 60 million, 60 million people, and and uh, and and those who are the uh, entitled to be covered by this institute, we have gathered information from them. There, we have a, a statement of the, of the income that been uh, declared, and we uh, compare it, uh, we cross-check it with programs, especially programs those that uh, where people are eligible along some line of uh, welfare. So we have identified a possible, we have uh, found uh, possible inclusion errors in several rural programs, and this information will make it uh, available to the uh, uh, program directors so that uh, we may see who is being benefited. Because in the case of Prospera, we did this, and what Prospera did is that they went out to the field and they confirmed the result of this cross-checking of information. And by means of a small sample, what we were told is that one out of, it, uh, out of 10 people that we told that they had uh, income that were higher than their, mon than their monetary line, then they went to a process of recertification in order to remove them from programs that they were not entitled to. Then regarding exclusion, starting from the socioeconomic information that makes up the system, we can identify the people that do meet the criteria, but which are not being addressed by the programs. And there's been a discussion recently, and it's precisely the, the coverage and right now, it's a, the coverage of uh, non-contributive uh, pensions. If we want to 
to increase the number of uh, uh, pensioners that do not contribute to the pension today. There are between eight and nine million people who are over 65, and the federal program for elder adults <coughs> uh, covers 65. There's a gap there of about four million people that uh, we have identified approximately, and we have identified three million people that do meet uh, the, the program criteria which are not being covered. And this is an error of uh, exclusion because uh, that can be mitigated. And, and well, just, just to conclude, uh, somewhat in the, with, with the large uh, goals of the system, large scale goals, we want to uh, remove redundancies in the programs. We need to uh, uh, identify these uh, uh, inclusion and exclusion errors, and uh, we want to be more transparent in uh, the execution of our uh, public uh, policies. Well, thanks, Mr. Luis Iñaki. And in the use of resources and transparency, I think this our contribution towards the state policy and very important. We have to point out as far as the social policies, errors of inclusion and inclusion must be pointed out. The political cost of an error of inclusion is uh, for some person that shouldn't be uh, covered by the program it is covered, and that's very high. But then. Uh, but then this uh, the focus of the entitlement is very uh, uh, strong here, and there may be exclusion errors where, uh, and there are things that we haven't managed to cover. Now, let's go to the Vice Minister from Guatemala, Mr. Carlos Vidal, and the question is as follows. Uh, what preventive actions can be undertaken in order for people who have uh, or, uh, gone uh, left poverty not to fall back into poverty? I think we should move on from the speech or dialogue of fighting back poverty to uh, rich uh, generators. The biggest challenge is to transform an individual and create the proper conditions so that individual can contribute to the society in a way of creating this rich richness to the society. And it's not only that we are just uh, moving out of poverty and satisfying the basic needs. But as we have said in other times, the responsibility of the state is to provide basic needs. When we talk that the community doesn't have uh, access to education, then I'm going to meet the need by building a school and then moving out of a poverty. But that is not enough and that is not sustainable either because poverty will be always a state where people will be getting in and out continuously. If there is no generation of richness, then our societies will be vulnerable. So this is a state where just simply are temporarily out and depending on the circumstances, and then they will be getting in and out. So the first thing is to understand that we as human beings work through subliminal messages and through phrases and very key comments. And that is something that we need to understand that each of the individuals should be a development source, a richness source, that each of the individuals is responsible and the main character of their own development and that we are creating those conditions so that richness can be can take place is not in us to create all this richness is in the society in the individuals and what we want what we uh, wish is to keep intensifying our efforts so conditions uh, can be set and have a prosperous and a thriving nation not because uh, the the government make it generally is because they had the conditions for doing it. How do we create those conditions so our countries could have the best entrepreneurs? Because the working source is not coming from the state either. It's coming from the private sector. But if we have the conditions for the private sector, then we can create these uh, jobs. If we create all the conditions for education, then we would have the academia and scientists and could go work in different sciences such as medicine or many others our our work our task is to create those conditions and when we 
find the dimensions that when we build these conditions, when they invest in infrastructure, that when we invest in, in health, is not only because we want people to get out of poverty, it's because we want to create that richness that can contribute. So this is what the most important or the most interesting and valuable thing is coming, that they will contribute to their own community so the richness is available. So it's, a, it's an, an effect of going back, of empowering the people so they can generate this development and richness by themselves in their communities. And then we'll, could be, then we'll be sustainable, and we will see the societies that are thriving, prosperous, and uh, with uh, minimum indicators of violence, abuse, poverty, unemployment, because the government is creating the conditions. So now let's move on that thinking that poverty, this is as a codependence state between the society and the state. Now let's see each individual as an investment, as an opportunity, and as the only way to make our countries rich and prosperous. Thank you very much for this message for development, for creating jobs. And it is more important because many of what we do is being classified as a, a social expenditure, uh, but we need to do it into the society to contribute for the development. And also, in order to complement, I would like to say that we should move forward hand in hand with economic development and social development and experience uh, to make it more equal with a coefficient. So it seems that it's n not reachable, but Norway started to create social policy when they discovered oil. So Norway created or started to create this well-being state when it was uh, rural and poor. So. I think that is exactly the message to see how to play with uh, the social development and the economic development together. Now let's move on, move on to the FAO to talk about a very specific topic that is our concern, specific for social protection, and that is coordination. I know it's a, a difficult co question. I don't know uh, what can we say in only five minutes, but the question is, is it enough to have this intersectorial coordination for the social protection in order to pro to contribute for the reduction of poverty? And what are the uh, specific elements to, to manage that coordination? So thank you very much. I think that in order to answer that question, and I think the word coordination is quite a trendy word in uh, many other countries is our buzzword. So we have all these groups and are trying to monitor the progress of all of them. So there is a lot of uh, enthusiasm with this coordination. However, I think we just need to start thinking, what do we mean by coordination? And also, what the level of intensity we meant. We have the coordination that is needed, for instance, for the use of public policies, and also is going to take all these programs, such as reducing poverty. We also have the coordination between two or more programs that are separated, but could be coordinated in its application, for instance, in a geographical zone specifically. Also, we talk about the the coherence uh, of all these public policies. So the first message would be, uh, let's start thinking of what do we mean by coordination then? We have different levels of intensity. For instance, we have communication, which is the lowest level. That is at the level that where 
information is being exchanged, then we have cooperation where we can set the working groups, the committees, and also we can have some supports. Then we have coordination that is being characterized by the presence of inter institutional agreements and are formal to coordinate and where all these bodies or, or individuals are more involved and committed in the plan planning processes and so and then we can reach convergency which is the real restructure of all these programs and services if that is essential or is not necessary for instance to have all these ministries uh, that are specialized for coordination my personal opinion in that sense is that beyond those specific structures the the first thing would be to have the mindset of coordinate. So what is the purpose or objectives of that coordination when? Maybe sometimes we only need to communicate. Uh, so among all these social protection programs, uh, is not always having a a whole program for social protection. It shouldn't be the same model for everybody or for everywhere. And and we, we should also discuss the weaknesses and strengths from the public institutions in each of the countries. So this is like uh, just a thought and just to move on in the experience that we've gotten, especially in the coordination between social protection and productive inclusion. We can see that there is an added value. We have made some impact assessments of all these uh, uh, virtuous synergies when we combine social protection programs with productive uh, features such as uh, being part of a program to have this coordination in a specific geographical area. We've made or we've performed several impact assessments in coordination with UNICEF and the Sub-Saharan uh, Africa and in Colombia. So what we've seen is this combination has a benefits that are greater than we thought. Even we know that the money transfer have a very important productive impact. In the case of Mexico, which is quite interesting for FAA, we are working very close to Segarpa. We know that 60% of the producers that are receiving Proago also receive Prospera. That, uh, give us a very clear sign that this program should be worked jointly. We also have a quite an important component. We have worked with this component. And in the last years, we've managed, along with the Sagarpa, to achieve important goals we have managed to get rid of so 60% of the aggressiveness of these components. So we have focalized, Sagarpa has focalized it for the small producers. Also, we have helped to incorporate 200,000 small producers that were out of this component. And also, we have managed to adjust the different fees and also for the benefit of the medium and small producers. We are talking about 1.8 million of small and medium producers. With this perspective then, uh, there is still uh, many work to do in Mexico and in many other countries in how to link a better link and have a, a more holistic and comprehensive policy of what we have as the support to the extreme poor in rural area, which are involved in culture as well. And even in the productive sector, we need to have a lot of work to do and to include, meaning um, extension, marketing, post harvest uh, services. So all of them could be included in these programs are focused to, to the small uh, producers. We're still working very closely with them in Mexico. Thank you very much, Ana Paula. I think it's important the message of what is the institution that is working better for, for this. I think we should 
need uh, we need to think about the different degrees of coordinations of sharing information to create these jointly teams or even up to a maximum level of uh, gathering or collecting budget but what is the purpose of all of that i think that is a, a key element here now let's go back to marianne and we are going to make a question about the new challenges the question is there follows there are new challenges in relation of privation of the people going back to the poverty. Maybe there are many other things that haven't been overcome, such as migration, uh, global warming. So how all of these new challenges have affected social protection in order to keep positive results for reducing poverty and to increase the social welfare? Lo más importante, o el aprendizaje más importante que tuve el día de ayer fue nuestro gobierno mexicano y sus expertos donde es meaning to say you have to continually adjust your goals depending on the needs and the dimensions by which your development agenda is uh, being impinged, impinged by all this development by, uh, rather this uh, challenges that we are faced like migration in my country there is very very high in uh, internal migration from urban to rural. There was also mention about the increasing problems of urban growth. Urbaniz urbaniz urbanization has become a problem instead of a development achievement, right? But then again, it doesn't mean that even if you are urbanized, you forget about the uh, poverty issues already in the urban sector. So these are the effects of uh, these new challenges, and therefore there are new uh, ro there are new laws already for migration, especially for uh, international migration is also one. Uh, the Philippines is a uh, supplier <laughs> of migrants, so uh, we have new policies already for uh, the protection of the rights of the migrants. No. And then there are continuing uh, negotiations with our destination countries between the Department of the Foreign Affairs and the Department of Labor and Employment. There have been recent uh, withdrawals even no, of uh, migrants from other countries where uh, there were reported uh, abuses. But then again, negotiations have also been uh, discussed and uh, the uh, uh, the the uh, benefits that have to be given to the migrants and the protection of their rights are part of the agenda. Further, in terms of climate change, uh, we are increasing the responsibility no, for response rehabilitation and recovery for the local governments. The local governments are key now to the achievement of uh, zero, um, zero deaths or casualties during, uh, during um, uh, typhoons or, or uh, natural disasters and uh, giving them also the incentives, so na national government giving them incentives. For gender issues in the, we are very strong with this one and we are already committed to the Gender and Equality Sustainable Development Goal where we have uh, established the utilization or the, the inclusion of a 5% budget allocation from the general budget of the, of the agencies and the utilization there, thereof is being um, uh, guided by the preparation of uh, gender uh, plans and budgets of each agency and each sector. Further to that, we all know, of course, that uh, we have an increasing population. We have met our 100 million mark already in last 2015 and is growing. And the implications of this, therefore, is giving greater weight to finance and the budget for the programs and projects 
to alleviate or eradicate uh, extreme poverty. And all the interventions for programs, projects, and uh, activities are, have a more stringent uh, prioritization scheme. However, the realities are the pro there is a, in, a prolonged implementation of crisis response aside from rehabilitation and recovery and the delayed, delayed execution of interventions. Because of this, the other, um, again, the interagency uh, participation is most important and, of course, the principle behind the pri public and private participation principle. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias. Eh, entonces, ahora, antes de concluir, eh, yo quisiera que eh, los panelistas puedan tener un, un minuto muy brevemente. Un comentario. Minute or so for a final comment. Maybe you can uh, mention something of the questions I didn't pose to them. And just to mention, uh, there is a specific question here for Ana Paola, and it's as follows What are the best practices? you have identified to involve companies or em enterprises for fighting back poverty and to keep the achievements that we have already got in poverty. I can give you a minute so you can think in the reply. Thank you. I would like to conclude by saying or by thinking and taking what uh, we mentioned yesterday in terms of the institutional design of the policies for social development in this social protection uh, system. Well, it is important to understand how this works, uh, how these programs work, and if they are robust, justifiable, and uh, identifiable, and I, we need to think in these institutions and the standards incentives. All these incentives could be uh, uh, resulting from all these uh, standards in the social policy. So this is important to see the weights and counterweights and to think on the different incentives of these institutions and how they could be used in an optimal way. I think it is important to think in what type of institutional design what type of norms and legal framework is the proper one or that could give us all this condition that it was mentioned previously that could be prone to provide all of these and all these uh, decision-making process and programs could be executed in the social policies and uh, protection uh, policies. Thank you very much for that question. This is a topic that is quite interested in, uh, in to all of us, and we believe that is a sector that we are leaving behind. Maybe a couple of again, examples from um, the agricultural side, from the, we work a lot with in Colombia uh, at this moment. Uh, as a consequence of the peace agreement, the number one point of that agreement is the implementation of a rural comprehensive reform. So that's ha that has brought a lot of ideas so, uh, to work with the private sector. There has been some other practices even before we signed that agreement with the banana sector. In the banana sector, there is a case that is called the Augura case that the, that the FAO were visiting us in Rome, where we have a case of a private company, a big one, that has a very close uh, dialogue with the Bananas Union. And there is an important dialogue um, between them because they manage to convey their needs. And some of them have been met through work. So for instance, this uh, banana company is uh, providing or supplying to workers some important services such as the access to health services. They also provide the different benefits or, and perks. Also, they have the daycare service, so women can also be included in this uh, workforce. They are getting training. 
and because this is a sector that is uh, creating a lot of income, they have also got some uh, scholarships for the children of the workers. So on one side, a decent job, we still have a lot to do, but there is also an important role of the companies or in, uh, and to get into a dialogue with the same uh, workers that have very specific needs to, met, to meet. And the government can also help them to incentivate that the companies can provide and to carry to protect those rights. On the other side, the private sector in terms of the family agriculture. So we want to boost uh, the family culture for some successful cases, like in the case of Brazil, in everything that is related to provide uh, these preferential markets or through the different public uh, purchases and having this minimum fee for the family agriculture along with these uh, family agriculture registers, which is also a quite an important topic because all these records or registers not all can be part of it and have uh, access to series of services and training, but also you can provide the access to the different markets they need because they have preferential markets. So in these two cases of private initiative, we have m many work to do, but we are working in that sense. Para nosotros, sí, para poder tener éxito, let us recognize the realities, but keeping in mind that we should be still very much people-centered so that we have collective, focused, and guided development agenda and directions. Without forgetting, of course, that we should ensure sustainability and then focused also on resilience building among our people and our communities, aside from having infallible or uh, strong institutional arrangements for unified action, and not forgetting, of course, the rights of our people. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you. Bueno, Guatemala is un país muy rico en recursos naturales, eh, que muchos durante mucho tiempo ha sido explotado. Years it has been exploited, and use it's a huge difference. We are in the middle of the process of taking advantage of our resources, and those resources are included in the multicultural feature that the country has. And that represents that all those natural resources should be well used to create opportunities to our people, to strengthen our monitoring mechanisms is extremely important. The implementation of indicators is something that we didn't have before, and we're in the process of those indicators, and that will be the guide to know where the investments should be located. The minister will be launching these indicators in December, and we need to say and we need to recognize as well that it has been a help, and due to the learning from the, our brothers from Prospera and Cedesol. Based on those indicators, we need to move forward to be setting priorities and uh, strengthen our efforts and actions. The power of our communities is also fundamental. The education of our communities will be the key to success or the failure. We can invest a lot in infrastructure. We can implement the different indicators, monitoring systems. We can strengthen many other things. But the main challenge that we do have is the way the mindsets of our communities. And we need to change that mindset. We need to evolve. And in that evolution is where we have our main challenge. That evolution doesn't mean just to leave behind all these traditions and costumes in our countries, the heritage that we have from our country. But we need to know how to use them properly. 
And based on that, we can keep building a country that provides freedom, that provides democracy, in order to decide and generate our own opportunities in and our own development. Once more, I, do, I would like to thank once again to GIZ for organizing this type of opportunities and to the World Bank that has been an important partner to Guatemala. And now that we are discussing as well with ACLSA to strengthen that, everything that we've done during the whole week, there is no doubt that it's quite enriching. It is extremely important to uh, us. When we talk on leaving no one behind, it is precisely how that countries that have rich progress and development could help us in those countries that are in the middle of their pathway. So we would like to thank these topics. And this is the main purpose of globalization, is for those countries that are in better positions or better conditions could help others like us with more difficulties. And this is something that has been made during this week. So I'm really thankful from my, from the bottom of my heart. And of course, uh, the, the thank the, to being thankful on behalf of the president of my country. So I just would like to ask for a round of applause for the generosity to all of our panel members. Well, thanks very much, Simone. Thanks our panel members and the ladies and gentlemen, our members. Are, we have a 20 minutes break. So outside, we have coffee, juice, and some refreshments for you. <laughs>